There's an old Wall Street saying, there are no old, bold traders. But really, how do you become an old trader? How do you evolve? What is the trader evolution from zero to hero? I'm Louise Bedford, and to open up this topic, I've invited Chris Tate, my business partner, who I'm sure you know, and also Jason McIntosh, just so that we can have a chat about this because it's fascinating to see. Jason, perhaps you could tell us a little bit about your background. Louise, thank you for, for having me on. It's always, always a pleasure catching up with you and Chris and, and having a chat about trading. And uh, look, I, I started my career back in the, um, back in the, the heady days of the, the, the mid-1980s. It... Um, it was probably about, look, I would have been a teenager at the time and uh, it was all through, through my dad's interest and involvement with the, you know, the, the speculative mining stocks of WA back in, you know, back in those times. And you know, this is back in the, the day when you know, there's no, no price quotes on the internet. It was like you, know, you got the morning paper and the afternoon paper to check your prices and, uh, and you know, I, I just found all that. I just found the whole thing fascinating. Never made any money at that during those years. Uh, didn't have any strategy. I didn't know what I was doing. And, but it was nonetheless, it, it captivated me, had my attention. And uh, the thing, things really got interested after I left uni and I got my, um, got my start at, at Bankers Trust. Now, Bankers Trust was a, look, it was a Wall Street investment bank and I worked in the, um, the, the Australian headquarters in, in Sydney. And uh, it was 1991 and it was just, look, that, that's, that's when my whole trading world opened up. And I remember the, the head trader's first words to me. He said, yeah, Jason, yeah, well done. You made it to this side of the revolving door. The hard part is staying here. And uh, yeah, look, that was my introduction to professional trading. It's, um, uh, I was around some of, the, some, of the, some of the best traders in the business. And yeah, look, I was really fortunate to get that start because you know, most, most people who get involved in investing and trading, you know, People don't get a start like that ordinarily, but you know, I had some of the best in the business to learn from. And it was all about you know, learning their strategies and how they do things and making their ways my ways. And because that's kind of how, how it works. You know, I learned from them and they learned from their mentors and, and, and so on. And, uh, and that, that whole investment bank trading world was, look, it's, it's, it was a remarkable you know, nine year journey through that. And uh, look, after, after that finished, it's um, look. I've been been out on my own since oh, I think it was uh, would have been would have been July '99, so 21 years ago. So since then, I've been yeah. You know, look, I, I trade my own money. Um, I've also uh, founded or, or co-founded uh, three stock market advisory services, and also um, a, a listed investment company. And um, the, the, the current business that I'm in is called Motion Trader. So it, Motion Trader, it's a subscription-based service. And what, what I do with that is, look, it's really, about, it's really about helping people make sense of the stock market. And so by that, it's not just about telling them when to buy and, and when to sell, although that is a really big part of what it's all about. It's also about explaining the process and helping people develop the, the skills and the, the confidence to you know, apply a, a process of stock trading and investing themselves, you know, much like what you and Chris do. And uh, it's, yeah, look, it's, it's, it's a lot of fun. It's, it, it's, it's fun engaging with people and helping them, helping open up that you know, mysterious world of, of financial for markets, which often sounds very complicated, but you know, when you break it down into process and strategies, like you know, we'll talk about today, it's you know, it's it's actually not. It actually is quite quite accessible once you know what to do. And it's great that you've been involved for 21 years because this is our 21st year of running our mentor program. So we're definitely running partners with longevity as well. Now, most of our listeners know Chris Tate. He is a larger than life type of person, definitely the sergeant major of our relationship in terms of guiding our traders. The good thing is this video will be available on youtube.com.au, actually .com 
forward slash trading game, youtube.com forward slash trading game. And you'll be able to see lots of Chris Tate's videos there. Chris Tate is the co-founder, of course, of talkingtrading.com.au and my co-founder also of the mentor program that we run with Trading Game. Uh, Chris, perhaps you could give us a little bit of a perspective here because Jason comes from a very professional hedge fund manager, the type of Wolf of Wall Street type of background. I don't, I certainly don't. And you've got a broken background as well. Do people need a specific type of academic background or a professional background to become an exceptional trader? I think something Jason said is actually very important, that when you break markets down, they're not as complex as people want them to appear. Now, the important part of that phrase is want them to appear. The retail or sales side of the industry wants people to think that this is an immensely difficult profession, that it's some form of voodoo slash rocket science slash you need an MBA from the Wharton School of Business. Now, that's in their interest to tell you that, to have that, well, you just leave it to me, little lady. It's too complex for you. I'll fix it for you. In no way, shape or form is it. I'm, I'm perhaps the, the poster child for people who don't have a background in business. My background is as far away from business as you can get, but I can still do it. From my perspective, if you're, if you're capable of putting your underpants on, then your pants, then your socks, then your shoes, in that order, you are more than intellectually capable of trading. And once people get past this notion that it is perceived to be too hard for them or it is presented to them as being too hard for them, then they actually see that once they start to apply the rules of common sense that they have in their own lives to the market, then a lot of the mystique disappears. A lot of the noise, a lot of the nonsense just evaporates because when you boil the profession down to its simplest form, you buy things that are going up, you sell them when they go down and you do not bet the farm. Now, the interesting thing is, is that most professional money managers who tell you that it's too hard for you to do, don't actually do that. They do the reverse. They sell things that are going up. They buy things that are going down because they have this strange mantra of when something's going down, it's more valuable. And they do bet the farm, which is why they deliver no value. And this is the important thing to note. In, in trading, you have a concept known as alpha. Alpha is the return you generate above what you could get just by buying the market. The vast majority of fund managers over a five, 10 year period deliver no alpha. So they don't deliver value. And so you could apply the mantra, well, yes, it's too hard for me based upon what you say, but based upon your results, it seems really far too hard for you as well. <laughs> But Jason, surely there would be some strategies to turn a losing trader into a winning trader. You must have seen this, not only in your background with BT and, and with the other companies that you've run, but also with Motion Trader now. Look, it's, it's, it's so interesting. The, the best strategies, look, they're, they're really, they're nothing new. They're, um, the, the, the best strategies are, are the things that um, traders and investors have been using for, for decades, if not, if not centuries. And, uh, but the funny thing is that you know, most people just don't understand this. They think that there are all these like, um, like secrets, secrets to investing, much like Chris was just saying, that, you know, that, that it's made out that it's really hard and it's inaccessible for, the, for, the, you know, for you know, uh, your average person to sort of get, a, get across. And, um, and I think that's why people often get sceptical when someone offers a service and says, hey, look, I can, I can help you. I can help you find good stocks. I can help you understand when to sell them. I can help you identify them. I can, I can explain a process to you. And people think, well, hang on, how, how, how could that be? If these people were so good and they had the secret, they wouldn't be telling me. So they mustn't be very good and they're just running a business to make, make money and to promote. And, and that does happen. It does happen a lot. It's, um, uh, and, and, but yeah, amongst the, all, the, all the noise and nonsense, there, uh, there are people who can 
really pass on these strategies to to others. And that look, that's how that's how those who learn learn. They're learning from others. No one, not too many people are doing this completely through trial and error. And you know, that's what I love about this business is that no one's born an expert trader. We all start from the point of no knowledge, and then we then we learn. It's um, you know, it's just about about you know, how you learn. You're going to learn through trial and error, or you're going to have mentors. You know, how's it going to work? But ultimately, it comes down to learning strategies that have been used before. No one's really reinventing the wheel, and there's no you know, there's no holy grail of strategies like this is the best thing you can possibly do. There are many processes at work. Some are fundamental, some are technical, some are combinations. Uh, yeah, and, and within those different disciplines, there are there are um, different processes as well. So there's no there's no single best way. And, mm. and uh, mm. so it's all about finding what what works for you, what you're comfortable with, what you what you what you resonate with. Because it's it's all well and good to follow a process when when it's working. Anyone can do that. When you're making money, everything's easy. The tricky part comes when, when the, the, the cycle turns and you start losing money. And now if you don't understand what you're doing and you don't have an approach that you're, that you're comfortable with, well, you're not going to be able to follow it and you're going to stop. And you can't be successful if you, if, if, if you stop. Then it's about um, you've got to be able to like, like follow that process through the market cycle, go through the down down periods and, and come out the other side. So that's why understanding what you're doing is so important. So you know, the, the five golden rules for me, I go through my five golden rules. So I, I come from a, from a, a price perspective when I, when I look at markets. I'm not so focused on the fundamentals. It's, for me, it's about understanding the price action. And you know, the rule number one, and this would apply even if you're a fundamental, analysis, fundamental investor, it's um, you know, spread your risk. It's all about having, having many relatively small trades, not a few big ones. Because the mistake a lot of people make is they, they concentrate their risk and they think, well, if I want to win big, I've got to bet big. And they'll go and you know, bet the farm on you know, whatever idea is, is at the moment. And that's just a disaster waiting to happen. So it's about spreading the risk. So no individual trade or investment can, can blow you up. And uh, by casting a wider net, you increase the odds of getting on some of the, some of the, the trades or, or stocks that can really run a long way. Uh, you know, number two, rule number two is invest with the trend. So a lot of people, as Chris was saying, like even fund managers, they'll buy as the price is falling. And you see, the trend is the path of least resistance. So if you're buying as the trend is falling, the odds favour that you're going to be, you'll see lower prices after you're bought. Whereas the opposite applies when you buy into a rising trend, the, the, the tide of rising prices is more likely to carry your investment higher. So you want to trade with the trends about putting the, the probability of success in your favour. It doesn't guarantee every trade or investment is going to work, but it's about, about odds. It's about putting the probability on your side. Um, you know, another key rule is letting winners run. Let your best investments run. I see so many people, they get a, a 10 or 20% gain and they go, look, this is fantastic. You know, the bank pays me you know, 1% at best and I've just made 10% in six months in a stock. I'm going to take that. You know, that's wonderful. But if you're always locking in 10% gains, how are you going to get 100% gain, a 200% gain? It just can't happen. So this, um, and it often has to do with fear of giving back a profit as well. People saying, well, look, I, don't, I don't want to risk this 10% gain, so I'll lock it in. But by doing that, they're capping their best stocks and, um, and, and often that won't pay for their, you know, the inevitable losses, which is, you know, the fourth rule, it's to cut your losses. And of course, many people do the opposite. They don't cut losses because they're told that you know, if they persist, they'll, um, the stock will eventually, stocks always go up in the long run. That may be true of a market, but it's not necessarily true of an individual stock. So if you're holding, your, you're losing stocks and you're not cutting them, you end, up, you end up running the reverse strategy to what good process is. You're running your losses and you're cutting your profits. So you've got you to you you twist that. You've got to cut your losses and run your profits. So if people get it back to front, all the time. And yeah, the, the final uh, rule that, that you know, my systems and processes and my investments all operate on is 
to give your give your stocks room to move. And so a, another problem which I, I see so often is that someone will say, look, I'll let my profits run. I'm up 40% on this stock and I've, I've got the 40% because I've let it run. But look, it's come a long way now and I'm getting a bit worried. I'm not going to take profit because I understand the concept of letting profits run. So what I'll do is I'll place a, my exit point um, 5% below the market, maybe 10%. If it comes back to their amount, but I'm letting my profits run, they'll say. 5 10%, that's, that's not much. That's not much breathing space. That happens in, you know, that could be a, a weekly or monthly pullback and they're out of the trade. They're not giving it the space to move. So if you want to trade a 100%, a 200%, 500% gain, you're not going to do so when you've got your exit point just you know, really jammed up below, the, um, below the, the stock price. So you've got to give room to move. And that's, for a lot of people, that's, uh, that's uh, the real missing piece of the puzzle that they never quite get. You know, they, you know they, they, can, they read books and they understand those kind of rules I was talking about. Yeah, spread risk, trade with the trend, let profits run, get cut losses. But they can't figure out why they're not making any money over after years of trying. And it's often because they've got their exit points too close and they're not giving those stocks room to move. So, yeah, it, it, it's, it's interesting, the trading game, the investment game. They're, um, you've, got to bring, you've got to bring all those pieces together. Otherwise, it doesn't, it doesn't work. Mm, it's so true. And we've found that it often separates into three specific components where it's the first one is system, which is what you've described. Make sure you've got a winning system. And then psychology, your trading psychology is so paramount. It's just essential. And then maintenance, how do you maintain those results moving forward? And Chris, what else have you found would be transition steps for somebody going from a fairly ordinary trader to an extraordinary trader? I, I want to touch on a theme that Jason touched on as well. And that is the notion that when we come to trading, you don't come as a fully formed trader. You're embryonic in nature. But the counterpoint to that is that you come to trading fully formed as a human being. So you have biases, you have beliefs, you have things you think are true. But powering those is your ego. And the central issue I see with traders in their inability to move forward is their ego. They cannot let go of either who they were, they can't let go of the opinions they hold, nor as an extension of that can they ever admit that they're wrong. And so they have this inability, as Jason said, to do simple things like cut their losses. Because whenever you, whenever you take a loss, for those of us who trade professionally, taking a loss is a mechanistic endeavour. It, it, it's like it's like putting the milk in the tea. It's not something you give any thought to. It just occurs. So it is that very, very much mechanical process. For others who, who have not moved to that sort of state, taking a loss is a reflection on who they are. I have made a mistake. I don't normally make mistakes. So therefore, I've not made a mistake here. The stock will eventually go up. And as Jason said, markets go up. Stocks don't have to. I've, I've known people who've held stocks for years, waiting for them to go back up, and they never do. I know people who are still holding Babcock and Brown, even though it's been delisted. They're in the belief that it will come back to the market and go back to the price they bought it at. Yeah, I don't think that's going to happen. I just, you know, in, in my world, that's not going to happen. And that's a function of ego. That, that's not a function of their trading system, their trading process. That's a function of the way they see the world. And it is people who are able to step out of that mindset and simply remove their ego from the process that are actually able to make the big steps. They're able to do, as Jason said, ignore the fact that they might have made 10% and let the system go until it's made 100%. 150, 200%. If you have an ego and your ego is involved in the trading process, then you're constantly seeking validation. 
And that validation comes by taking the small wins. It doesn't come by sitting there going, I've got nothing to do today. I'll just have to leave it. It, it comes by this constant churn, this constant interaction, the constant interplay of your ego with the system and the market. And I do think that is a part of the maintenance of results as well, that we do have to release what came before and embrace where we're moving towards. Jason, what would you say would be the secret to long-term sustainable success? Yeah, look, I'm, um, look I, I look at my own path and like how, how I've evolved as a, as um, in, in the financial markets. And it's, look, by nature, I've developed into a, into a planner. You know, I, I, I like routine and I'm, I describe myself as being process orientated. And, and that, that feeds through with just through the who I am generally. So, you know, my, my days are quite routine. Some people would say, oh, that's a pretty boring sort of day, but it's just how I'm wired. I'm, I'm routine orientated and process orientated. And that really helps with uh, consistency, which is a key part of, of repeatable success. And, um, and uh, so I've got a, some members to my service contact me through emails and stuff. And, and I've found through this discovery process, so I've got you know, several pilots as subscribers. And they tell me that what they like about the, the approach which I, I, um, I provide is that it's, it's quite similar to what, what they do. So, you know, before the plane takes off, there's a, a pre-flight check. And it's, um, it's the same sort of thing before putting on, on, a, on an investment or a trade. From my, my perspective in my world, it's like you don't just say, oh, I'll buy that. It's like you, there'll be a, a checklist of things that need to, need to be happening. The share price has to be rising. There has to be an uptrend. There's volatility questions. There's, there's volume questions. There's a, there's a checklist of things that need to be in place before you buy. Same thing happens when you're in a, if you're in a plane and an engine stops. Well, the pilots just don't say, well, you know, engine stopped. What will we do now? There's a process to follow. They get out another, another list of things to do. Same from, from an investment standpoint. It's not like, oh, this stock's gone down. What will I do? It's like, well, we know what we'll do because we have a set of rules which will say, well, it's come back, but that's okay. It hasn't come back too far, so we know what to do. Okay, now it's come back further. Do we give it more room or do we wait a bit longer or what do we do? There's no thinking about that because the rules are already in place. It's just follow the process. So this is all about how you get that, how you get that um, uh, repeatable, repeatable success over time. And I think, uh, I think another, another big thing is that you need good emotional control. And like, like the emotional control, now this is, doesn't matter how good your processes are, unless you have emotional control, it's not going to work. Because you see, the, I think like the emotional control is sort of like the glue that, that holds the whole thing together, that brings it all together and, and, and makes it work and makes it sustainable over time. And, it's, um, and I think, um, you know, look, without emotional control, I think it's hard to be successful at anything. You know, I, I, saw, this, I saw this really good interview with Roger Federer recently and like you, you see Roger and he's uh, you know he's got to be probably the you know the, the coolest calmest guy in the tennis court and uh, so I just assumed that was always the case but you know it turns out you know, Roger was actually a hothead like he just wouldn't pick it and um, he was talking about his early days and he said he was um, he said he used to he said he used to you know throw the throw the racket at the net and he'd be you know yelling out at the umpire and giving commentary on a shot that didn't work out and uh, he says, you know, this one time he was, he was 16 and he's at the training centre and uh, you know, a shot hadn't worked out, frustration, and he hurls his racket, you know, takes out a screen, new glass screen, scoring screen or something, and uh, smashed it. So his penance was he had to clean out the, the, the toilets for the next two weeks or something. And, you know, he's in there, he's you know, serving at his time, and he goes, you know, this is just, I've, I've got to do something about this, it's just not working and uh he said it took him two years two years to what to find what he calls the um the, the fire and the ice 
So the fire is, uh, you know, the, the driving determination to, to be good at something and to want to win and to want to, want to you know, push yourself forward. And the ice is the emotional control to hold it all together when it's not working and to, um, you know, to, you know you, you, you're down two sets to one and, you know, you, to come back, to say, look, I can come back. But then to say, if you don't come back, well, hey, you know, it didn't work today and that's okay. I'm, I'm, you know, I'm cool with that. And I can take you know, lessons from the failure and I can you know, use it to help me build. And, and this is something that you, you, know, you, you need to do as a, as a trader. And, um, because, you know, like you, you look at Roger and once he mastered that, he, his career took off. And I think that's the same with a lot of successful careers. Once people master their, their own self-control, their own emotional control, they become very good at excelling in whatever it is that they do. And from a trading perspective, look, I think, you know, there's no substitute to having the, the control. You know, say, you know, as Chris was saying with the ego, it's like, you know, take the ego out of it and just put the, the control in there. And the um, and uh, I think if being able to control your emotions and that becomes, you know, that becomes, you know, your, your um, you know, a firewall to self-sabotage. And uh, it can, you know, it, it makes a difference. It can make all the difference between uh, being a fly by night. I've had a few wins, but now I'm blown up because I can't control it all to having repeatable success over many years. And I think it's trainable as well. I'm watching a movie at the moment. Um, you know, I'm falling asleep so early at the moment as well. So I'm watching it over a couple of nights, free solo, where this climber climbs without ropes in Yosemite. I've and, seen this. It's amazing. Oh my! It's terrifying. <gasps> oh, so, seeing jump from rock to from yeah. one yeah. side to the That's other it. across a void, oh. and there's nothing if he misses. Oh. Oh, it's a bit of a drop. It's, Chilling, absolutely chilling. And they popped him in an MRI and they had a look at his amygdala and they found that it wasn't firing the way the rest of us have our amygdalas fire. And as we know, the amygdala is the emotion centre. It processes emotion, pushes it through to the hippocampus for memory formation. So if he needs a higher level of stimulation to give him those kicks. I mean, he could have been born that way, but I do think you can train your way into that same state. If you are a naturally flighty person, if you are somebody that jumps at your own shadow, there is a definite way that you can calm yourself down and get that routine in your life. You know, I look at you two guys and you're very, very calm people. I think that I'm a little bit more flighty, um, frankly, but when it comes to trading, I've trained myself to take some deep breaths, enter into my spreadsheet, the position, enter into the trading platform, step by step by step by step so that I don't have that emotional like explosiveness that guy climbing he was even calculating from a planning perspective where to put his fingers on particular rock formations to get him up El Capitan and it was just amazing to see it was it was terrifying it was absolutely chilling Chris, the, the, I was just going to say the, the, the problem when you have such a high threshold is that the decisions become winner takes all. Yes. And, and as a trader, you can't be a winner takes all sort of person because his decision making process is a double or nothing process. And, yeah. and you can't have that process as a trader. Because Although Jason, he did stop climbing when things weren't quite right. He backed out of the challenge. Yeah, and I did think that that was good. But it, it, it's a little bit like that because they've done the same thing with uh, special forces soldiers. Like one, one of the, the problems of being a young man entering the military is that your brain is not fully formed. It just isn't. Male brains don't settle down till about 22, 23. We mature later than women. The problem that has is twofold. One, it's a terrible problem for PTSD because PTSD becomes ingrained as a pathway and it's very, very hard to treat. It's immensely debilitating. The second is it primes them for immensely high thresholds of, look, I don't want to say entertainment, but stimulation. And the problem with that is sooner or later, you reach a threshold that is fatal. Traders do the same thing. 
a, a lot of traders are double or nothing traders. And it's the word Jason used, repetition. It's the need for repetition that I think kills people because they have this popular image of what trading should be. It should be this thing where you're making hundreds of decisions a day, you're making lots of noise, uh, you know, you're moving money here, moving money there. You're being a complete and utter wanker. But that's not trading. That's being a wanker. Trading is a repetitive process that you do in the same way every single day. And the repetition kills people because they, they don't accept that that is the way it should be. And we've experienced this in the mentor program. We've had people who've had jobs they've considered repetitive. They've left their job to take up trading and gone, oh, crap, it's exactly the same. Well, yes, it is. Because without that mechanistic approach of I enter here, stop is here, I will exit here, I have this much risk, we're done. Oh, isn't there anything more? No, that's it. But without that process, none of trading works. No matter what people think or what they've been told or particularly what social media tells them, it, it just doesn't work that way. It, it's this boring, dull process line of a freaking profession. But it has to be that way because that, in doing it that way, you control yourself. But the rewards are the things that can get you going too. You know, I don't think there are too many people that love trading just for trading's sake. There has to be a carrot at the end of the line. And I think that that's what gets people going. And I love watching that. What about for you, Chris? What are some of the personal breakthroughs that you have had? I, I actually think that one of the mistakes people make when they come to trading is they bring with the metaphors that they've heard. You know, buy when there is blood in the street, the famous Rothschilds quote. What they don't actually understand about Rothschilds is he was a systematic trader who had a better information flow than anybody else. He knew of Wellington's victory at Waterloo before anyone else because he'd set in train an information gathering process to make certain that occurred. That's why he was successful. He couched it in these terms because that appealed to other people. He was mechanistic. He understood the value of information and he understood how to utilize it in front of other people. And for me, there are, there are two things, there are two observations I note in myself. One, trading is a profession of the pause. It, it is not a profession of instantaneous decisions. There is no decision in trading that can't really wait until you've taken a deep breath and had a little bit of a think. You don't need to worry about stops because people often say to me, what about stops? Well, they're all automated. Machines do those instantly for you. You don't need to worry about those. It is people's compulsion to buy on impulse that's problematic. And the most important thing for me is the pause. It is stop. And strangely enough, in day-to-day -day life, if people just introduced a pause before they open their mouths, their lives would be a lot better and a lot easier. And the second is this simple notion of surrender. You have no control. So thinking that you have control is an illusion. It, the only control you have is the decision to enter and the decision to exit. The market will go wherever it's going to go with or without you, whether you're on board or not, because that's its job. You just simply have to surrender to that. It's a little bit like surfing. In surfing, you surrender to the wave. You, you have no control other than the fact that you're out there sitting waiting. Now, you can control how long you wait. You can control where you wait. But once the process begins, you're a passenger and you need to understand that. Too many, too many traders, particularly males, and I used to see this on trading floors, used to think that somehow they could influence what was happening. And you can't. You just have to surrender. And it's as simple as that. Life becomes much more peaceful when you do that. I don't know if there is a typical journey that you can categorically say across every trader's life either. You know, you just mentioned how guys come in to the markets as well with a slightly different attitude. Some of the males that I see enter the market, they think that they are superheroes and they put on positions that are so large and they don't have any awareness of the risk. And it takes a few knocks to bring them perhaps down to size where they're prepared to educate themselves. Some of the women come into the market and sure, some of them have that attitude too, but 
usually there's more self-doubt there there's more the feeling is this the male domain is this something that i can do for myself and for my family so they're more cautious and it's interesting to see how that has resulted in a big study by barbara nodine it actually showed that women with the more cautious attitude end up making more money than the blokes who are the gung-ho ones <laughs> which is well, the gung-ho guys the gung-ho ones always get the risk catches up yeah, yeah, sooner or later. Up with people, and if you're if you're in there swinging for the fences, it's just a matter of time before you get bowled at the stumps. Mm. It's, uh, I saw it happen so many times that when I was uh, when I, when I worked at Bankers Trust, it's um, it it was called the you know we were going into the revolving door because there were always someone coming out the other side, and invariably it'd be it would be um, you know a, a younger trader with a who would take too much risk and would would blow up and they'd be they'd be shown the exit it's um yeah being able to can't if you're too cautious then then you can't pull the trigger on a trade but if you're too gung-ho then you're going to blow yourself up so it's about finding that that middle point where you're fearful enough of markets to respect them but you're not so fearful that you can't execute on your on your process Actually, Jason, uh, one of our mutual friends, um, David Hobart, who is also coming on to Talking Trading, he told me a little story about you. He said that your bosses, until the results all started pouring in in your account at BT, your bosses said to you, you know, come on, mate, open up, come on, be a man, you know, get that testosterone pumping. And you'd say, look, you know, I have my system. I will follow that system and I appreciate your input but I will be doing it this way. And in the time that your results were pouring in, there were so many other people going out the door that had that macho attitude. Yeah, there's, look, there's a, there's a real, real pressure on a, in a bank dealing room to, to, to make something happen, to place a trade. And you're taking a receipt and if you're not doing, seem to be doing something, well, you can get away with that for a little bit, but you know, you've got to... You know, make something happen and that often means forcing marginal taking marginal trades and uh and like yeah that's just the the nature of the of the operation you don't have the um and this is one of the advantages the everyday trader has from from home is that they they don't have a uh their boss looking over their shoulder saying why haven't you placed a trade today they they can sit back and they can wait for the right setups they don't have to don't have to swing at everything that comes comes their way, and it's um, yeah. Look, some people some people overtrade and and take you know too many positions on and you know get in trouble doing that. And then I got in trouble for doing the opposite for for not not taking on enough, waiting for the waiting for the waiting for the the, the, the right the right setup. Um, yeah. So yeah, being out of the environment, I guess it's it's freed me more to like what I do now. I couldn't do. At a bank, because I take medium-term positions, and and medium-term positions involve you know drawdowns, which last for more than a couple of days, and so it's yeah. Look, what I do now is out of sync with that that world. That's more of a, um, a shorter-term environment in how they how they approach risk. And this is the advantage of being private traders for the three of us, because we don't have those pressures. What about the role of mentors, Jason? Who have you had in your life? What are you doing to develop your mindset now? I'd be curious to hear your views. Oh, look, I've had, um, I've had some amazing mentors over the years and you know, they've made a, made a huge difference to, to how I've developed as a, as a trader. And a lot of a lot of that came from my my early time at, at Bankers Trust. Uh, the um, you know my, my my first first boss there when I got my graduate job was uh, it was in the charting department, and you know he he taught me that uh, markets have three phases: there's an up phase, a down phase, and a sideward phase. And he said if you could identify which which phase the market was in, well then you had the potential to make a lot of money. And, and that's always stuck with me because I'd just come from university where the professors had told me that markets are efficient, there are no trends, and nobody really has an edge. And so it, it, his, his mentoring opened my eyes to that whole world of looking at, looking at price action. And, uh, and that's, been the, that's been the foundation of what, what, I've, what I've done ever, ever since. 
And then, then moving into the dealing room, being around other traders, seeing their strategies, seeing how they enter, how they exit positions. And uh, I remember my, my boss, when I joined the foreign exchange desk, he said, he said, Jason, if you want to fast track your learning, he said, read about people who have already been successful. And so, it, like, I had the advantage of being around a lot of people like you know, in real life I could talk to. Um, but then the, the next strand to that was reading about other people who had had success in the markets. And um, he, um, you know, my boss, you know, handed me this copy of this book called Market Wizards, which I'm sure oh, yeah, I'm sure I love you know. that book. Yeah, it was written back in the early uh, late eighties, early early nineties. It, it was a, you know it's a collection of interviews with with top top Wall Street traders. Well, not all Wall Street, but but predominantly American traders. And uh, and there, there were two in particular in, in that book, which really their their, their processes and their, 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 the way they saw the markets was I could really really relate to. And they're the chapters that I read and reread over and over again. And then um, yeah, look, really really it was about learning their ways and making their ways my ways. And and that's what a, what mentoring is all about. It's about you know standing on the shoulders of the people who have come before you, and it fast tracks. And my, my boss was right. It does fast track your, your progress. So the alternative is that you learn everything by trial and error. And, and that can get you to where you want to go, but it usually takes a long time. But if you bring in the experience of, of, of um, someone who can, can mentor you and, and, and show you a, you know, a template, which, um, which I know you and, you and Chris talk about, you talk about a, a, a trading template that provides you like with a roadmap it's a roadmap of, of where to go. Now you may decide you don't follow that map to to the end point, but it gets you going. And then if you branch off in a different direction, then you can do that. You can build your own your own philosophies around that. But just having that initial map, that initial scaffolding, can it can make the difference between um, a career progressing or a career coming to an abrupt end. I don't think my time at Bankers Trust would have been successful had it not been. Or you know the, the fast tracking of my progress through being around around um, talented people who I could learn from. If I had to learn from time and error, I would have you know I would have run out of time. You know that you really have a short runway at those places to sort of get some momentum, and trial and error wasn't going to work. So yeah, mentoring it's um yeah, it's it's uh, it's it's a wonderful thing to to get and. I think the best way, if you know, not everyone's friends with a with a Wall Street trader, and that's okay. You can do it through books, and you can do it through, you can do it through, you know, getting someone else's process, getting someone else's system, like like you you offer, or you and Chris offer, and you know, I offer through my service. It's like you know, then adapting that to to your own ways. Yeah, you're fascinating, Jason. Look. I have just received so much value from you personally. I love the way you approach the market. I love that we have this conjoint evolution going where our ideas, even though we may execute differently, the concept and the core principle is usually the same. I don't think there are too many things we totally disagree on in terms of the core principles. So Jason, where can people get more information about you and your journey, but also about the services you offer? Offer. Look, I've set up a, um, a set up a page for for talking trading listeners. It's motiontrader.com.au forward slash talking trading. So nice and easy, and and that will allow people to to sign up for. I've got a four part. It's a four part training series which talks about the you know the, the five key rules which I spoke about earlier. And and how to uh, go into more detail about how it all works and how they apply to a to a to a successful investment process, and uh, yeah, look, I use a lot of my own my own um, stock trades as examples. So you know, it's it, it's it's great to talk about these big concepts, but then it's it's also nice to be able to like like see it in a real life example. So okay, well, you know, this is how you actually apply it. This is the application of of that rule of you know, buying with the trend or, or giving it room to move or cutting a loss, whatever it may be, you actually see it. And I think through, I think through seeing something, it really helps. You can read something and that's great, but then to actually see it, it really helps it helps imprint it on your, in, in your head. And then it makes it something that you can then go out and try and replicate yourself. And when it comes down to it, that's what it's all about. Replicating uh, a, a process that has a, a long history of being successful and, and and making that your own. 
I love it. So that website again is motiontrader.com.au forward slash talking trading. That's the one. That's good. (laughs) And Chris, what other things do you think you'd like to share with our listeners so that we can round out this interview because our time is up now? I I think one of the things, it's a human trait. And it's a human trait to look for differences and to assume that those differences are somehow deal breakers or uh, too large to overcome. When people look at traders uh, of any sort, the key point to look for, and this, this touches on what Jason said about market wizards, it is to look for the similarities. Look for those things that are continuous across groups or across individuals because success leaves clues. The great mistake people make is they think that success is unique. No, it's not. It is idiosyncratic to the person because it's theirs, but the mechanisms by which they were successful are not unique. It's just that they found their own spin. They they found that point in the Venn diagram where all the bits sit and where they sit. And once people manage to get to that point, and again, we come back to this notion of ego and surrender, let go of what you think is right and find what actually is right, then trading becomes a much easier process because you begin to see that there are similarities in people, that people who do well do certain things in a certain way. And as Jason said, if you can shortcut that process somehow, then you won't end up living in a cardboard box under a bridge. Which should be the aim for everybody. Well, yes, it's a a life ambition. It's probably pretty good. Like success is a formula. It's a formula. It's not random. Uh, Luck is involved. I've had luck throughout my career, which has which has made a difference, which has made you know, key differences at times. But it's, um, but in general, it's um, you know, success is a formula, and if you can, you know, you, you follow it, you are. Um, it's, you know, it's, it's all about odds, isn't it? It's about putting the odds in your favour, and uh, you, you, you follow a, a formula of success, and you increase your chances of that actually happening to you. Absolutely. And the thing that we love about our talking trading listeners is that they are backing themselves. They are putting the odds in their favour of not only having a successful trading life, but also being the best person they can be. We've loved bringing you this interview. Keep listening every week on Talking Trading because we will be giving you trading gems that you'll be able to use and it will last a lifetime. That's our total goal. This started out as our passion project, gosh, about seven years ago now, and we're still going strong and we love bringing you these types of interviews week after week. 